I'm John Duvall. Welcome to the Scriptural Way Bible Study. The Scriptural Way Bible Study is brought to you by the Seminole Point Church of Christ, located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to thank you for your interest in spiritual matters. Now, let's take our Bibles and seek the Scriptural Way. Greetings, I'm John Duvall. And I'm John Hall. This is a Scriptural Way Bible study. John, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing good. Good, good. Nobody can hear me. <laughs> well, while, you know, John right now is, is, is a distance away. He'll sound far closer here in just a second. <laughs> My brain's a distance away. <laughs> well, that's okay. We do that sometimes, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, you know, your voice is sounding stronger now. It sounds like you were kind of weak for a little bit. <laughs> Feel better? Oh, yeah, much better. <laughs> it's good to have you with us for our study tonight. We appreciate so much you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for this time period of studying the Word of God, of seeking the scriptural way. Dale is away tonight. He's not going to be with us this evening. He'll be back with us next Tuesday, Lord willing. And uh, we were going to have Luke to sit in. And his work schedule changed uh, earlier today, so they, he had to go into work and was unable to be here with us. So it's just you and I. All righty. <laughs> John, let them, for those who may be joining us for the first time, remind them how to, let them know how to participate in our study, if you would. Okay. Well, if uh, you're listening or watching, either way, uh, you'll notice on the right-hand side of your screen, there's a, a little blog, so to call, so you so call it, I guess. Chat, chat window, room, yeah, you know, chat whatever, room, whatever mm -hmm. terms you like to use there. And uh, first thing, you can sign in as a guest. You don't have to have a username to sign in. You can just do a guest and per type in your own name there, and that way we know who you are. Um, and uh, if you have any questions or comments throughout the study this evening, please do share in the in the chat room there. In the bottom box is a place that you can chat or type your questions or or, or uh, comments there. And also, of course, uh, below the, the uh, viewing screen there, you'll notice is a copy of the lesson in a PDF format. Is that right? It is a PDF format. Okay. That's right. Yeah. And so be sure to bring that up, and you can follow along with us as we're going through the lesson as well. That's right. That's right. Um, we've mentioned before that, that you can write to us also via email. And we don't have a lot of people send us email, John, that, that I catch. Now, I have it set up on my office computer to, to catch questions at scripturalway.org. So if, if you've ever written to us in email and we have not gotten back with you or acted like you even exist, um, <laughs> let us know in the chat room. Say, hey, I sent you an email last week and, and I didn't hear back from you on it. And uh, because it's very possible that maybe I've messed up somewhere or another in the configuration and... Um, could be missing something or maybe forgetting to check my junk folder, who knows. But we'd definitely like to hear from you. We'll give you that address again as we go through the course of the study. Because now you can participate in the chat room. You know, John, on our mobile site, we don't talk about this very often, but on our mobile site, you can still you can also participate in the chat room. Mobile site? Yeah, we, we I have I have a mobile page. Okay. And so if you if you're if you're huh, if you're driving and someone else is operating the phone, obviously, um, you can go to mobile.scripturalway.org. And you'll have top little window that'll be the video window. Beneath that is the audio only window. So if you try to uh, tap on the video and it's just because of your bandwidth isn't playing right, then just stop it and click on the audio and that should play. But beneath the audio window, if you'll just kind of scroll down, you'll see the chat window. Okay. And so theoretically, <laughs> you should be able to sign in and participate via, via a mobile device or an iPad or a Nexus or whatever Android device you might have. You know. And so we'd definitely love to hear from you and have your participation in tonight's Bible study. Well, John Dell's not here tonight, so we could study something else. No. <laughs> We're not going to do that. What are we looking at this evening? Well, we're looking at the book of Colossians, and we're going to start in chapter 2 this evening. And uh, we're going to look here in the first section, 
uh, we'll see some some uh, warnings about false teachings, okay. uh, vain doctrines versus basically the preeminence of Christ, basically the Word of God. Um, and we'll also be talking about, especially in this first section, about our, our walk uh, a little bit as Christians and some warnings that, that Paul gives and, and, some edific- and some encouragement that he gives as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what I'd like to do, John, is, well, let's go ahead and read. <clears throat> I know the outline kind of breaks it up just a little bit differently. But let's go ahead and read the first 10 verses of this. Go ahead and kind of get the context established there. And um, if you would, John, I'll have you to read the first uh, down through verse 5. or Yeah, down through verse 5, and then I'll pick it up in verse 6 there. Okay. So verse 1 of chapter 2 of Colossians. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now, Now verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality, and power. So let's back up there to verse 1 for just a moment. And, and we've talked about this before. Our Bibles and our books, uh, books of the Bible are divided up for us, not by God, but by man. And um, I've done wrap the, my microphone cord around my foot again. <laughs> um, and so sometimes a chapter break may seem just a little bit odd, or you may see a, a thought continue to, continuing to flow through the chapter break. So just kind of keep that in mind there. In verse 29 of chapter 1, and this is at the tail end of that chapter, the Apostle Paul writes, To this end I also labor, striving according to his working which works in me mightily. All right, what he's talking about here when we make this transition from chapter 1 into chapter 2 is that we see here his desire for them to continue faithfully before God, continuing to preach, continuing to warn every man, just as Paul himself had, uh, had done. But in verse 2, John, he says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea. Now, essentially, what was that conflict that he kind of talks about there at the, the last part of uh, cha- uh, verse 1? Well, he's basically talking about his, his striving, his conflict that he's undergoing for the gospel's sake, really, for not just for them, but in this case, since he's writing the letter to them, yeah. <clears throat> he addresses it as such. Uh, but he's working you know, for the, through the gospel for their sake. And uh, his goal, of course, is to teach them the truth and to make sure that they are becoming complete. That's right. Uh, as he mentioned there in verse 28. Um, this, this spiritual growth. Right. Yeah. Um, oh, go, go ahead. Oh, okay. And, and of course, we also, you know, I, I think you might could bring in a little bit of the fact that he is going to be um, in conflict in many different ways uh, throughout his, his uh, efforts to, to preach the Word of God. Okay. Um, not just the fact that it's a conflict to, to teach, but the fact that he's going to go through many sufferings and many trials in doing so to bring them that truth. That's right. That's right. Um, one thing to note here, the idea of conflict, we could say struggle. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, the, it is interesting, he mentions the church in Laodicea. <clears throat> he did write a letter to the church in Laodicea. More than likely, it's not the one that people claim to have. There actually is, among the quote-unquote lost books of the Bible, a letter to the church in Laodicea. But it's been examined by scholars, by biblical scholars, and, and compared, and it just doesn't fit Paul's writing. It just it, it seems like something that was written years later to kind of give some 
letter to the Laodicean church there. But he references at, at the end of this letter that the letter to the church in Laodicea be also read before their brethren in Colossae and vice versa. Um, but what, when we look at this conflict here or this struggle, I want you to know what a great struggle I have for you and for those in Laodicea and for as many who he has not seen. You know, this is a struggle for all Christians everywhere that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love. Let's talk about that for just a moment here, the idea of their hearts being encouraged and them being knit together in love. It's interesting to think of love in the idea of knitting <laughs> something together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, love essentially joined them together. Um, just like knitting would join you know, two different pieces of yarn or various pieces of yarn, maybe sure. different colors. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, their love, of course, is, is knitting them together. And, you know, being knit together in a love here would allow them uh, to basically help each other yeah. through the struggles and trials of life. And so we see here it says that their hearts may be encouraged. They would be, why would they be encouraged? Well, because they're able to assist one another. They're able to get through difficulties and trials together. Uh, because they are joined together in this same effort. That's right. And it's through the love of Christ uh, primarily, but then also through their love of each other and the Word of God that they are knit together. That's right. That's exactly right. You think about what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 11, and things that, that the Lord has given to the church to edify the church, to build the church up there, to make the church stronger and, and not be as children. But a crucial element within this is love. And, and, and I think, I think that, that this would very, be a very good point to, to kind of elaborate a little bit more on this was Paul's grave concern. Mm -hmm. um, we have a comment in the chat room that um, bro brother, brother Greg Wynn from uh, Columbia, Tennessee, they do uh, the virtual Bible study on t Thursday nights at 8 o'clock Central Time, the virtualbiblestudy.com. He talks about what Paul had invested and maybe that being a lesson for us. Yeah, I think he makes a really good point there. He says, maybe the reason we don't accomplish enough for the Lord is that we are not as seriously invested in the work as Paul was. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's impossible to argue with that point. That's right. I think that, yeah. you know, I think that is definitely one reason, um, if there aren't other reasons, but I think that is definitely a primary reason. You know, and I struggle with that for myself from time to time. I often wonder what, you know, why am I not doing more? Mm -hmm. You know, why am I not out there uh, maybe doing a little bit more, putting a little more effort into it, studying more? And, and hopefully, you know, as a, as a Christian, everybody asks themselves that question. Hopefully nobody has sure. is, is reached that point to where they say, well, I'm, I'm doing just right. I don't need to do any more than I'm doing. I'm just good. Because then we might want to look at ourselves lest we fall, take right. heed, you know, lest we fall, that we think we're doing just fine. So I think that's a good point, but I do believe that, you know, many of us are, uh, you're probably struggling with that. Well, something that, that I see here about Paul that I think sometimes we, we get lost in a little bit in our own lives is, you know, Paul traveled around. I mean, he, we know he stayed, I think, three years at Ephesus. He had, makes a reference to that. And so he would stay for extended periods of time. But, you know, we may live in one area and worship with one congregation for 10 years, 15 years. And if we're not careful, our scope becomes very narrowed in our investment to just that local congregation. Mm -hmm. and, we, and, and I'm not saying that as congregations we meddle in the affairs of other churches because that's unscriptural. But as individual Christians, we should still have the same prayer for all Christians throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And with Paul, it just so happens because of what he was doing, he actually went to visit and was genuinely moved when things were not as they should, praying for opportunities. In this case, that their hearts be encouraged, that they be knit together in love and obtain to all the riches of the fullness of understanding. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's what his, his prayer to God was for. And that should be our concern as well. And right. you make a good point. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have a, a friend in Alabama who preaches there in Alabama and he, he's done some things specifically in the community just, just so that he could be out in the community yeah. more. Yeah. Uh, Cub Scouts leader type stuff, uh, uh, baseball coach, mm -hmm. so that he could actually be a little bit more present yeah. in the community. Not that he's going to stand up on the baseball field and preach a lesson, but you know the parents that, of the, the kids that are on his team, he has now an opportunity, someone he knows 
you know, he actually talked to them by name and talked to them about the gospel um, a little bit more, you know, a little easier because they know him, they recognize him, yeah. and they have a relationship now. When, when I lived in McAllister, um, I was still, still wet behind the ears, so to speak, as far as local work. McAllister was my second uh, full-time congregation. And um, uh, a gospel, uh, we had a gospel meeting, and, and the, the, me, the preacher who came to hold the meeting was Lewis Sharp. He preached in um, Arkansas area, in the Little Rock area. And he and I, we had a couple of conversations during the course of the week. You know, and it was great for me because I was, I was still young. You know, I was still in, in, in my late 20s at that point. And um, he was, I'm not sure how old he was, but he was older. <laughs> and um, he, he told me, he said, in his own opinion, and, and it was his opinion, he said, he felt like that it would, it's good for preachers for a time in their life to work in the secular field. Now, he wasn't saying oh, you, that preachers have to do that. Right. But the advantage to it is that you get to see life through the eyes of the average member, all right? You go through what the average, and I use that in quotes, obviously, member goes, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, many preachers, their, their life is spent behind the desk in their office, maybe doing mm -hmm. some neighborhood going door to door, uh, maybe as their kids are young, getting involved in PTA and things like that. But, you know, Aaron is, is a great example there. I, I gave his name away, didn't I? Um, and, and, if, and if they had decent internet connection where he lived, he could join us <laughs> as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could bring him in on, on camera one day. But, um, but anyway, though, the point is, is that we have to understand that it is important to live in the world but not be a part of the world so that we can be an influence on the world. And that's... I think as preachers, sometimes it's easy to get stuck behind our desk and busy working on sermons and articles and, 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 and various video casts and stuff like that and forget to go out and really engage people, mm -hmm. you know. And um, there's a preacher, the preacher who's currently preaching in McAllister, Oklahoma. Um, he, he works a full-time job, and, but he, he preaches and it gets, them, he gets him into the community, into the heart of the community. Mm -hmm. And um, you get a lot more opportunities that way. Mm, right. Yeah. So we have to we have to feel as if we have to have the same feelings of investment. <clears throat> any member of any congregation should be invested in that congregation and in the labor of the kingdom of our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, any any other thoughts about that, John? That you might have on uh, verse two there. No, I don't think so. All right. The ultimate goal in our growth, being knitted together in love, as he says in verse two, is to have the understanding. To have the knowledge of the mystery of God, to, to understand what the Bible teaches. These things that in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is what, as Christians, we must know. Okay. Why? Look there in verse 4. Why is it we, it's so important that we know this? Well, I don't want to skip verse 3 just yet. <laughs> I did, didn't I? <laughs> well, you go. didn't really skip it. You did mention it. but Just to um, go ahead, though. Yeah. <laughs> As you mentioned there in verse, uh, you read there in verse 3, um, in whom, that is in Christ, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You know, I just found that interesting, that, that, that phrase. Uh, first off, we know this is in Christ, mm -hmm. but it says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So all the treasures, you know, when we think of treasure, mm -hmm. what do you think of? Pirates. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No. <laughs> Something valuable usually, right? Exactly. Something somebody treasures and, and, and exactly. wants, desires. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I'm about to lose my voice for a second, but um, it says here in Christ, there, those, all those treasures are hidden. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, which treasures? You know, all treasures? Well, not physical treasures. You know, right. we're not talking about anything like that. Maybe some physical blessings and benefits of being a Christian or in Christ, but the spiritual blessings, all the spiritual treasures that we have, and essentially, ultimately, I should say, the salvation that comes through Christ. That's right. You know, that that yeah. greatest of treasures is, is found in Christ. And so I just found that interesting, you know, that, that point there. I think we, I mean, we understand that. I've just never noticed it here in Colossians chapter 2, this, this succinct phrase that in Christ is where all these treasures are. And he talks about uh, in verse 4, I think that's why it's leading into verse mm -hmm. 4, where he says, now this I say, let anyone should deceive you. So there's, there's, there's people out there who are trying to deceive the Christians and show and try to show that there's some treasure somewhere else. That's right. That's uh, right. You know, let me, let me talk to you about this, this complicated 
uh, teaching over here and look what you can benefit from it over here. And they make it complicated, they make it difficult to understand, and they, they try to deceive the Christians with those words and they're bringing them really away from really where, those, where the treasure is. That's right. And it's only found in, in Christ Jesus. That's right. We need to talk uh, a little bit more about this because it is going to segue us into verse 4. <clears throat> but before we do that, I realize that we are five minutes past our first break. So we're going to go ahead and listen to Brother Whit as he tells, uh, reminds everyone about the, the meeting place, the, uh, the, the meeting times and so forth of the congregation. And on the other side of the break, we're going to talk just a, a couple more comments. About the, I'm glad you backed up to verse 3. Very good. Uh, a couple more things to say, and then we will go into verse 4 and see the benefit of us knowing these mysteries and, and the, the, the wisdom and knowledge. So stay tuned. We will be right back. Hello, I'm Ron Witt, one of the elders of the Seminole Point Church of Christ. On behalf of the elders and members of the Seminole Point Church of Christ, I would like to invite you to be our guest at any of our worship services and Bible classes. The meeting place of the Seminole Point Church of Christ is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, zip code 73013. The Seminole Point Church of Christ meets Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Bible classes, 10.30 for worship service, and 5 p.m. for our afternoon worship service. We also have Bible classes on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Whether you live in Oklahoma City area or you are traveling through Oklahoma City, we would love to have you come and be our guest. We have Bible classes for all ages. At the Seminole Point Church of Christ, our focus is to teach only the Word of God. Rest assured that when you visit with us, you will find that we will appeal only to God's precious Word. Now, let us return to our study. Welcome back to our study. John, what came to mind just a moment ago as you were talking is what Peter says in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, there in verse 18. Uh, over in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the Apostle Paul, and we're jumping into the, the context of this, obviously the tail end of it. But he says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All right, so notice that grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The question why is answered by what we just looked at over here in verse uh, 3 of chapter 2 there. Mm -hmm. Because within him, all the mysteries. And, and, and you, you were, I really like the idea when you're elaborating on the idea of a treasure. We, I said pirates, but you associate <laughs> pirates with hidden treasures. Mm -hmm. Things, you know, the treasure exists. Somebody knows where it's at. The majority of the people do not. And that's kind of the way this mystery of salvation is. The majority of the people have no clue. But only those who are willing to seek it Mm. We'll find it within the Word of God. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You see in First Corinthians chapter one, <clears throat> in verse twenty-four, where it says there, where he tells the Corinthians, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Christ is specifically the wisdom of God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here That's in exactly that verse. Right. Yeah. And of course, we see in verse three the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and we understand there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Uh, knowledge simply being the understanding of a fact. Uh, I know a fact, I know a truth, and then of course wisdom being that ability to apply that knowledge and being able to put it to use. Right. And of course the ability to understand the mystery has been talked about in chapter 1 and apply that knowledge through wisdom, uh, through Christ and understanding of, uh, of what Christ has done for us and the blessings we have, we get the great treasures. We understand the great treasures yeah. that, that await us. That's exactly right. Now all this is done is given to us so that we are not deceived by persuasive words. This New King James translation renders it persuasive words there. And that is a very interesting point because if you have an individual who's been taught the gospel, they've been convicted by the gospel, and they have acted upon that conviction and obeyed the gospel's call into salvation, you would think that an average conversation would not be enough to pull them away. 
But, you know, it's, it's kind of like um, if sometimes you may study with someone and their answer is, well, my preacher says or my church says. Well, in passing conversations, that's the sum of their knowledge. But if you persist with persuasive words, you might be able to teach them because they don't have the sufficient information there. Mm-hmm. Well, for, for people who are obedient to the gospel's call of salvation, it shouldn't be, now I've just said this all wrong, let me back up for a moment. When, when we face the casual conversations of faults, immediately we should dismiss them. But it's the persuasive arguments that oftentimes lure Christians away from the truth. The persuasive arguments, not the casual discussions, right. but the persuasive arguments. Yeah. And that's where we have to be on guard so that we are not persuaded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's always individuals out there that are convincing in the way that they can present arguments even if the arguments make no sense, somehow sure. they, can, they can be very convincing with the argument. And I think in a lot of cases, you know, complex and confusing philosophies, essentially, uh, are often a useful tool of the false teacher. Um, and, you know, as they try to distort the simple truth of the gospel. And that's what we need to realize. The, the truth of the gospel, although it had been a mystery, right. it's now been revealed. And Paul said in many places, you can understand it. You know, I've written these words of which you can't understand when you read these things. And so they are understandable. They're not a mystery anymore. They're not complex. It's not cloudy. Now, not every teaching in the gospel is, is super simple to grasp. But the teachings of salvation mm-hmm. and how to come to eternal life, all of those teachings are very simple, very straightforward, um, always to the point. That's right. But if we begin to neglect that mystery then we will be deceived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's the warning there. Um, Now, verse five is we're kind of talking about this. This leads into it. He recognizes that he's not always gonna be there with them. Um, Although he's with them in spirit, so to speak. He says, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. He rejoiced in that fact. They had listened, Mm -hmm. they had followed, they were, they, they, they were not being deceived by persuasive words. They, they had a steadfastness there of their faith in Christ. And so he admonishes them in verse 6 to continue to walk in him. And, and we'll, we'll get to that here in just a second. But go ahead. Yeah, you know, what you were talking about there about quickly kind of uh, pushing aside the, the, the conversation uh, that somebody might be having with, that's trying to teach error. Uh-huh. It's not real, not real persuasive. They're just, you know, in right. co- casual conversation, as well as those that are very persuasive. Uh, uh, Paul tells the Roman brethren in, six, in chapter 16 and verse 17 and 18 what they need to do when they come across that scenario. Okay. And he says there, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are so up, for those who are such do not serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. So there are those out there who are portraying to be Christians, or portraying to be followers of Christ. When they come across and start teaching things contrary to the truth, mm-hmm. the simple truth which Paul had already revealed to them, they're to avoid those individuals. <clears throat> they're trying to you know, put them aside, stay away from them, because those are individuals they know are trying, specifically trying to lead them away. That's right. That's and right. so not, not just the fact that it's easy to dismiss it, but if people are, if we know individuals who are our brethren, are supposed to be our brethren in Christ, um, and they're teaching anything contrary to the Word of God, if we cannot correct them and help them to understand the truth, we need to, be, we need to avoid them. That's right. That's exactly right. Something I was looking up, uh, the King James Version in verse 4 says enticing words. The English Standard Version renders it plausible <clears throat> arguments. And, and I like that, that, that translation uh, or that definition of the word there. I was looking up the Greek word to see if that Greek word they're used in verse 4 was akin to faith. All right, so faith is that, that, that idea of being persuaded, being convicted by something, and it's not. Um, it is the idea of, of enticing words, of a plausible argument. So mm-hmm. This, what they would be hearing wouldn't be someone who said, well, Jesus is not the Christ. Right. Although that'd be a later argument that, of course, someone would make. But it would be a perversion of the truth that sounded plausible. Yeah, it almost yeah. could be. If you exactly. tried hard enough, you could, you could follow along with that. And, and how, many, how many Bible discussions can we throw <clears throat> into that? 
creation. Well, yes, yeah, plausible that it could have been seven million years. You know, it's plausible that it could have been this or that. You, you hear people kind of say that. It's really plausible. The, the flood during the Noah days, Noah's days was an area-wide flood, not a worldwide flood. It's plausible. You know. And you have Christians who, not knowing the truth and not staying by the mysteries, could be led astray. Mm -hmm. um, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 mm -hmm. there. Uh, re I referenced this section earlier, but specifically, and we'll have Jimmy bring it up on the verse there, John, if you want to read that. In Ephesians 4, verse 14, a warning there by the Apostle Paul. Okay, he says there in verse 14 that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Very good descriptive words there. Yeah. You know, Paul often doesn't mix words. No. You know, he doesn't He's usually beat around the bush. Yeah. You know, say it a little nicer. Don't yeah. offend anybody, Paul. Yeah. You know, he, he says it, he calls it what it is. That's right. That's exactly right. And that's, that is the goal. And, that's, and so what we see there in verses 6 and 7 is we see the opposite of someone who is a child tossed, tossed to and fro by every doctrine. You know, in verse 6, we, we see this. We are to walk in Christ. And then he says in verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving there. Notice the phrase rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Mm -hmm. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We use that, we, we give the plan of salvation. First step to becoming a Christian is you gotta hear the word of God. But really, that statement applies in every aspect of a Christian's life, leading them to salvation and maintaining their faithfulness unto God. Mm -hmm. We've got to continue to study His Word to be thoroughly convinced by that Word so that we may be built up and established in the faith. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how these two verses go together. I mean, you can basically say it's, it's kind of like a circle. Uh, those who are rooted and built up in the faith are those who will walk in Christ Jesus. And those who are walking in Christ Jesus and continue to walk in Christ Jesus are those who will become more and more rooted, right. uh, get firmer and firmer foundations, in the Word of God, in Christ, um, <clears throat> and be harder and harder to be pulled away by these strange doctrines that somebody might bring, no That's matter right. how plausible, you know, no matter how believable of an argument they might make. They've been walking in Christ. They've been living for Christ. They've been understanding His Word. They've been able to gain wisdom through that, through that life that they've been living, through the application of that knowledge that they've been putting mm -hmm. into place. And so when someone comes and tries to teach them something a little strange, even when there's a lot of truth mixed in with it, they're able to see that error and able to walk away from that and say, now, now here's, what, here's what the real Word of God really says about that. Yeah. It looks like you, you can have an, an odd-looking mole and you've seen it for the last five years. It looks fine. You go for your checkup and the doctor says, we've got to do something about that. <laughs> you know, he knew what to look for. Yeah. But I, I, I'll give you an illustration, though, that happened to us when we lived in, uh, in McAllister, Oklahoma. We had moved out to this little city called Krebs, and, uh, more like a town, really. And we were going to uh, work on the flower bed. And there was, I think it was a hibiscus plant. I'm, I'm not a horticulturist by any stretch of the imagination. I know what a rose is. Anyway, so we had this plant, and, and it was too big, and it was in the way, and it really didn't belong. And so we decided we would dig it up. I could not get that plant out of the ground. I mean, the root system was so solid. I guess I would have had to have dug a huge hole in order to have fully got it out. So we decided just to cut the plant down. We figured surely that'll kill it. And we laid the black paper over it and, you know, and started planting the other stuff. And the next spring, up comes that plant, pushes its way up. Talk about a root system. Well, that should be us as Christians. Mm -hmm. you know, no matter how much we take, we should be willing to stand strong mm -hmm. and, and not as the song says, I shall not be moved there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> as you mentioned, uh, faith coming by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We see that to walk by faith essentially means to incorporate the principles in our life, kind right. of what I was alluding to there a moment ago. You know, and, and what we need to understand is that means we, we have to spend time studying God's Word. In order to uh, live by the principles that the Word of God teaches, we have to understand them. We have to, right. we have, to have the knowledge before we can gain the wisdom. That's right. Uh, and so to gain the knowledge, you have to re be reading and, and, and looking at the Word of God. And, you know, there, many people will spend, you know, unlimited amounts of time in secular education. Um, some people seem to make it a, 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 
kind of what they do going to school, gaining more knowledge. And not that there's anything wrong with gaining more knowledge and going to school. Nothing wrong right. with secular education in that regard. But many individuals make that their goal, just more knowledge about the world, mm -hmm. more understanding about science or math or whatever it is that interests them. And they may make it uh, a goal of their life to gain material wealth or the gratification of fleshly pleasures. And of course, all these things you know, are, cause, are, are there because they've been deceived. Uh, and, and deceived that, to believe that there's some great value in those things and pulled away from the understanding that the great value is truly found in the Word of God. That's right. And we see That's in exactly Hebrews right. chapter 3, uh, in there in verse 12 through 14, where the Hebrew writer says here, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. You know, he, he's, he's talking to Christians. You know, he's telling brethren to beware, and he's telling that they could be pulled away, they could be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And he's warning them. And many times, unfortunately, it's the world, especially today, it's that, that physical uh, strivings in the world to gain wealth, to gain knowledge, to gain power, mm -hmm. um, some prestige in some way, that next position at your job, whatever it is, it's those things that are possibly deceiving us and pulling yeah. us away from the Word of God. Well, let me, let me kind of expand this context a little bit of, of Hebrews 13, 12 through 14, and what you were saying, okay? Especially with what we face around us and everything. The context of Hebrews 3 uh, and 4, he's using, the, he's using actually a statement made by David in the Psalms, okay? And David was encouraging the children of Israel to, while it is called today, not to harden their hearts, as in the days of the rebellion going back to the first generation. Think about that first generation. They, they, they left their wonderful life in Egypt behind. <laughs> you know, and here they come to the mountain and Moses is gone for 40 days and they long for the good old days of Egypt. And then they get all the way up to the land of Canaan and 10 of the 12 spies come back and says, you know, great land, beautiful, milk and honey and all that other stuff. But you know what, we're grasshoppers in the, in, in the sight of the giants that live in the land. And so the people say, why did you bring us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness? Just, oh, what was me? Well, David tells the generation of his day that do not harden your heart as in the days of rebellion. And he goes on to make the point within Hebrews 3 and 4 that since that first generation did not enter into that rest, there therefore remains a rest for us today, unless we get caught up, like what you were saying, in the ways of the world. Unless we want to be like the world and walk like the world just as that first generation did, if we want to walk that path, then we won't have that, the paradise, that rest that remains. Mm -hmm. yeah. so anyway, it's an interesting context, yeah. yeah. We had a few passages here referencing verse six. I wanted to look at one of those in Galatians chapter two, verse 20. Uh, looking again at um, Colossians 2, verse 6, at the end of it where he talked about, so walk in Christ, mm -hmm. so walk in Him. And here in Galatians 2, verse 20, Paul told the Galatian brethren, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. So Christ is, Paul says Christ now lives in him. It's not, he's not doing his own will anymore. Right. Solely his own will. Uh, he's doing the will of Christ first in all things. That's right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now all of this, wait, let's go ahead and take our last break for the <laughs> evening. <laughs> We're going to forego the, the advertisements, if you would, for the Truth Factor discussion because we're on a break until January the 8th. And so January 8th of 2014, we're going to start back up the Truth Factor Studies, Wednesdays at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time. We haven't yet, um, Paul and, and Tom and I, we haven't yet decided what we're going to look into next, um, and, uh, and Daniel as well. we'll. We're going to kind of come up and see if we want to do another book study and which one to look at. So if you have any suggestions for us, maybe a book study that you think would be great in factoring the truth into our lives, maybe a gospel, you know, we're... we're, we're um, working up what we are going to um, be looking at then. So stay tuned, we'll, we'll be right back.
If you would like more information regarding the Seminole Point Church of Christ, then visit our website at www.seminolepoint.org. Better yet, come see us. Our meeting place is located at 16300 North May Avenue, Edmond, Oklahoma. We meet Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Bible classes, 10.30 for worship services, and then Sunday afternoons at 5 o'clock for worship services. We also have Bible classes on Wednesday evenings at 7 o'clock. Thank you so much for your interest in the Seminole Point Church of Christ. We're looking forward to seeing you soon. Welcome back to our study. John, notice now in verse 8, the great beware. Mm -hmm. You know, we have all this preparation, and now here comes the beware part. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that again in verses, um, verse 8, actually. Okay. Yeah, so exactly, you know, beware coming right after he gives them this great exhortation to, to be rooted, to be built up. So he's going to give a good reason why they need to be that way. Right. So he says in verse 8, Beware lest anyone <clears throat> cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. <clears throat> you all right? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to make it. Are <laughs> uh, we going through verse 10 again? No, let's just okay. talk about verse 8. For <laughs> You're just laughing at me, okay. Yeah, I am laughing at you. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> You're doing good, though. <clears throat> You're pushing through that. All right. <laughs> all right, notice what he says here. Notice the idea of cheat mm -hmm. there in verse 8. Be beware lest anyone cheat you, as the New King James Version renders it. Through philosophy, we might think human reasoning, empty deceit. Okay. In other words, they're trying to deceive you with an argumentation that does not exist, that, that is not a valid argument. According to the tradition of men, the way that men look at things, the way may, maybe literal traditions, maybe he was warning them about people coming over from the idol worshiping world and say, well, look, you've done this all your life. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what's wrong with that? Yeah, I think with traditions of men, sometimes you think of traditions, those are things that have been established for a right. while. And so people often look at these and go, well, so and so way back when. I mean, you got to, that, that person can't yeah. be wrong. They were really. Uh, you know, uh, maybe well looked at in the community or exactly. something like that. Well, my family's always right. done. You know, tradition can be used but both in, 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 in uh, uh, the uh, repetitive <coughs> customary practice or as a teaching, mm -hmm. you know, depending on the context. Um, according to the basic principles of the world, the way the world views it, the world, the way the world thinks about it, <clears throat> and not according to Christ. And, you know, there are several doctrines that, that we'll throw out here with, with the, the, the noted intent not to talk about it tonight <laughs> because of time. But there are several doctrines that plague the church. Uh, I saw a discussion earlier today on Facebook that this one, uh, this one fellow has a page devoted to the question of continuous cleansing, you know. And um, they're already, you know, you know, both, you know, both sides of the fence there going at it on that subject. And his fundamental reasoning that he makes, and, and it's a very human reasoning, is that there are sins that we don't know that we commit, therefore God's grace is going to cover those sins. But he had to back up and clarify, say, well, not all sins of ignorance, but some sins of ignorance. You know, and short of a babe in Christ, and I could be wrong, I question the existence of a sin, uh, of an ignorant sin. Mm -hmm. Now, now if, and, and if we mean ignorant, if by ignorant we mean I wasn't paying attention and I forgot that I did it, well, okay, right. that's possible. But if you mean ignorant that I didn't know it was wrong and I did it anyway, and you're not a babe in Christ, you've got other problems. Right. Unless the Word of God is so impossible for us to know all right and wrong. The whole marriage, divorce, or remarriage. Um, the, the whole... Uh, the, the, the day age creation theory as far as um, millions of years. The, the, the point is there's so many things out there that even within the church they pull upon human reasoning and traditions of men to try to try to deceive Christians there. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I, I think this you know verse even connects back to verse 3 when you think of the words that are used here. <clears throat> In verse 3 he talked about treasures. I'm not going to make it. <clears throat> You want to drink them my water? <laughs> I think I'm almost there. Okay. <laughs> but in verse, in verse 8, he says, Beware lest anyone cheat you. Well, I mean, to be cheated means you had something to be cheated out of. It had to be something valuable. Right. And otherwise, it wouldn't even, you wouldn't even be cheated out of it. You probably wouldn't care if it was gone. 
Um, he says here, you have something valuable that someone is trying to cheat you out of. And the question is, what are the Colossians in danger of being cheated out of? And essentially, as he's saying here, there's people who are trying to teach you things that aren't so. And if you follow after those things and you stop following after Christ, you're going to be cheated out of what Christ offers. You're going to be cheated out of uh, what's most valuable, what the most valuable possession one can have is. And that's our salvation that's found in the gospel. Yeah. So when you get pulled away from the gospel and you start believing things contrary to the gospel, then unfortunately you're now being cheated out of that great reward, those great treasures that are found in the Word of God. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and ultimately, when you look there at verse 8, he says, and not according to Christ. You know, if we're walking according to Christ, according to His Word, His thinking, Colossians 3, we're going to get into this as we start Colossians 3. If we seek those things that are above, not the things that are below, if we think with godly thoughts and, and seek godly, godly uh, desires, then we're not going to be led astray by these things. But if we listen to the wisdom of men, then we will. Okay. <clears throat> you know, if, that? if anybody had the right and, and some experience to be able to teach about traditions of men, it was definitely Paul. Right. And Paul even alludes to it in uh, the letter to the Galatians in chapter 1, over in verse 14. And he says there, and I, that's Paul, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries. He was making great strides in Judaism. He was, mm -hmm. he was approaching the top uh, of Judaism, as it were, here. Uh, and he says, beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He knew the failings of following traditions. Right. Yeah. You know, he had had firsthand experience of being very zealous for those traditions, thinking it was just the right thing to do, and was unfortunately very abruptly you know, shown otherwise, and was very, uh, fortunately for him, very repentant and sorrowful for that, and turned very quickly from those traditions. That's right. But now he's, he's as experienced. He understands what those traditions do. And he recognizes, verse 15 <laughs> says, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, it pleased God to bring the Apostle Paul to do the work of God. Mm -hmm. Going back to the investment that Greg was talking about there early in our study. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts on verse 8? Because verses 9 and 10 are more of a comment on Christ. Um, I had a passage here and I was trying to look at it real quick to sure. remind myself what it was. Um, Galatians chapter 4 um, and verses 3 and then verse 9 and 10. Uh, Paul says in verse 3 here, even so we um, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. And then in verse 9 and 10 he says, But now, after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and seasons and years and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, of course, here we understand those you know, things of the world, those, those rituals, those, those you know, basic things uh, that they were doing in the past. And, you know, you can kind of compare those a little bit over here to that empty deceit or to those basic principles. Hey, there's Moses oh, with the water. Oh, somebody saved me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jimmy. Um, so, again, you know, Paul, you know, has very good understanding. He's taught, you know, various times on these particular issues. Well, and, and in the context there of Galatians 2, <clears throat> or the passage from Galatians 3, 3 you just read. Or 4, verse four. 3, yeah. Yeah, ten. 4. Um, can be looked at from two different, uh, two, two different directions. One direction, he's talking about the Jews. You know, they, the, 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 I say the Jews. The Jews that have been converted to Christ, mm -hmm. being pulled back in by the Judaizing teachers, mm -hmm. being brought into bondage again. Mm -hmm. And look at it from the direction of someone that has, been, that has become a Christian who has left sin, again, being pulled back into right. bondage there. So yeah, it's a very good, very good point there mm -hmm. with that. All right, so let's see. So we know that as long as we are grounded in Christ and His teachings and the mystery within the faith, within the Word of God, we study, we don't listen to men and the persuasive arguments. This is the, the proof text of our life. This is the guide of our life, and this is what we follow. We then look at verses 9 and 10 in commenting about, you know, this not according to Christ, the way the world walks. He says about Christ in verse 9 of Galatians 2, 
For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Any thoughts or comments on that? Well, I think, again, it, it's pointing to that preeminence of Christ. Okay. Uh, over all these other things, Christ is preeminent. Uh, don't be fooled. Don't be pulled away by these traditions, by these deceitful teachings, by these pull teachings of the world, whatever it is. Right. All those things, even if they seem great, even if it, it looks so enticing, it looks somebody wrapped it up in a wonderful, you know, pretty wrapping and put a wonderful bow on it and, you know, it's got you all excited, you know, stop. Think about where your blessings truly come from. Who is truly in control? Who truly has uh, the power, the authority to be our God and our Savior and our King. Right. You know, Christ right. does. That's and right. only Christ. Exactly. Any thoughts, any thoughts when he, about what he says? For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Any thoughts from you? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah. It's, I thought you might have some. Yeah, I thought you thought I might. <laughs> Actually, to me, to me, you look at it in, the, in a very simple fashion. We look at the fellowship here. You know, you think about when Christ was on this earth in John chapter fourteen, verses seven uh, through nine. There, let's take a minute and look at that. John chapter fourteen, beginning there in verse seven, he says. <clears throat> If you had known me, you would have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him in verse 8, Lord, show us the father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? For he who has seen me has seen the father. So how can you say, show us the father? You know, and you think about when he makes the promise in John 14, 26, that the father would send the, the spirit, the comforter, and then again in John 16, he says, I will send the Holy Spirit, that spirit of truth there. We are looking at, and Paul is making the point that in Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. When you have Christ, you have the Father, you have the Holy Spirit in work, in purpose, in fellowship. Christ was here doing the will of his Father. He sent the Holy Spirit to do the will of the Father and the will of Christ. And now Christ is reigning at the right hand side of God. The Holy Spirit works through the Word of God within our lives as we study and, and we follow that word, it is all within fellowship. They're dwelling within him. They're all working together. And, and I think that's kind of the idea there. And we see that in our fellowship with him. Right. So yeah, all, so all the characteristics of God exist in Jesus. Yeah. And that's interesting, he says bodily. So is that talking about even while here, all those characteristics that God possessed still resided in Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus was able to say, have, have you not seen me? Yeah. Have, I not, have I not been with you so long, and you, you still ask, you know, show me God? The, um, I just want to check on something there. I've got the little footnote, and you may have one, too, in regards to verse 9, the latter part, in mm -hmm. bodily form, mm -hmm. so instead of Godhead bodily. Mm -hmm. And the English Standard Version renders this, for in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Um, I, I, I would question, was Paul talking past tense mm -hmm. when Jesus was on the earth? Or is he talking in present tense, and I mean present tense in the lives of Christians, not the lives of, of deity, obviously. Mm -hmm. Present tense that when they worship, that, that, that when they talk about Christ and what he has done, he, he is working for and on behalf of and with the authority of and with the Father. You know, and so present tense, he the the dwell the Godhead dwells within him, and he's in them, or past tense when he was on this earth, and that 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 will be a very sticky point when you come to Gnostic teachings jumping forward towards the end of the first century. Mm. You know, they they didn't believe that that deity dwelt in a fleshly body, mm. and so that definitely becomes a very important point later. Mm -hmm. So it, it it could be the way, and you know, I I, I wouldn't have a problem with either position right. on that. No, yeah. I mean, could I mean Paul could be saying both at the same time? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's why Peter says there are some things that Paul's written it's hard to understand. <laughs> Second Peter three. So, and so, but but I would tend to think, and I nearly missed this point. I would tend to think he's talking present tense 
the fellowship of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit because of the next verse. Mm -hmm. All right, the next verse. And you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in Christ. Mm -hmm. Just as Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one in their workings and their purpose and their fellowship and so forth, you are in Him. You are complete in Him, not lacking. Right. And in Him, He is the, the head of all principality and power. He is reigning at the right hand side of of God mm -hmm. reigning on the throne. Yeah. Yep. All right. Any thoughts or comments? <clears throat> no, I think you. I think you got that exactly. Okay. No, I, I think that's always a good point to dwell on that that idea of being complete, and or perfect. Um, and then what, how can we be so? Yeah. The only way is through Him, you know, in connection with Christ. Exactly. Yeah. And, and and if you think that they, maybe we've missed it or we've missed something uh, important to this, don't hesitate to jump in. Mm -hmm. that, that's the one thing about a book study. A book study like this does make it kind of harder for the chat room <clears throat> because we're just going hammering on each verse, mm -hmm. okay? Um, unless we skip a point or say something off or we, we just miss something altogether. Whereas with a more topical study, it does generate more, can, can generate more mm -hmm. discussion, you know, and that's... It has in the past anyway. It has, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we, have been, we have been tentatively sketching out some topics to look at when we come, uh, once we're done with Colossian studies. Uh, we'll, we're gonna look at a lesson uh, roughly titled, Things That God Hates. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, the, 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 uh, the better aspect of the new covenant. We're gonna talk about uh, you know, what does Paul mean when he talks about the works of the flesh. We, we haven't looked at the, fruit of the fruits of the Spirit yet, we'll bring those in. So a lot of different things that, that we haven't really talked about, we'll try to bring into future topical studies. So. <clears throat> yeah, of course, here at the end of verse 10, he does say um, also, who is the head of all principality and power, all rule and authority, yeah. uh, any, anything that, that you would associate with having power, yeah. with having rule, with having uh, authority over, uh, the ability to direct, the ability to acquire something from, Christ is the, is the head of all of that. And he says over there in Ephesians, tells the Ephesian brethren in chapter 1, uh, in verse, uh, starting in verse 19, he says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Yeah. While they're here, any authority, any power, any God, Christ is far above that. He, he rules right. over all those things. Way back when, way back when your father Moses was there, he ruled over all power and authority then. Yeah. You know, before the beginning, he ruled. To the end of time, he will still be the one who's over all power and authority. Um, notice, and uh, Jimmy, bring this up on the screen there, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And specifically, verses, starting in verse 24, we're going to, again, jump into the midst of the context. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there in verse 24, the Apostle Paul writes, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. For he must reign till he's put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. Verse 27. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to, the, to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. The very point that we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All is, you know, Jesus is reigning and all are under him mm -hmm. with the exception of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Let's see. Looking at our time, I think that we are probably at a good stopping point. Verse 10 there. Um, because as we, 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 we just, there's so much, especially when we look at verses 11 and 12 next week. You know, many times you'll hear people in quoting the plan of salvation. They'll talk about Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Um, you know, makes the point, for as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, therefore like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also to should walk in newness of life. Romans 6 uh, verse 4 doesn't say that we are raised up to walk in newness of life. It's somewhat implied. Mm -hmm. 
But Colossians 2 verse 12 does use the phrase in which you also were raised with him. And so there's a lot more to talk about, yeah. you know, beginning there with verse 11. So we'll hold that off to next week. And I think a good verse to end on is to maybe wrap all the way back around to Greg's comment uh, at the beginning there about um, mm -hmm. not being as seriously invested as Paul in yeah. the work. And then also tying that into Christ's authority as we were just talking about. Right. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 and 20 when Christ gives the Great Commission, He says, uh, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Mm -hmm. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Yeah. So why should we have that? Why should we be an invested Christian as Paul was? Because Christ has the authority and he's asked us to do so. He That's requires exactly right. that of us. That's exactly right. Um, he expected... He gave no less, mm -hmm. so we should give no less. Yeah, most certainly. Well, let's call the study then done for tonight, and we'll let Dale know we made it all the way to verse 11. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where we'll start uh, up next week there, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. And let me, let me encourage you to do this, and, and based on the folks that I see in the chat room, I have every bit of confidence that you're already doing this. Continue to do as he taught there in verses 6 and 7. Continue to walk in him. Continue to be rooted and built up in him. Continue to be established in the faith. And then, and a phrase, John, we didn't really talk about, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. You know, never take for granted what God has done for you. Live in it, live by it, live with it. Let it be the defining, uh, the, that defining definition of your life and then always abound in thanksgiving to God for, that, for the revelation of the mystery and the strength that we have within, the, within Jesus Christ and His Word. And do that, and then you will continue to live a faithful life unto God and be that great example in the world and the, the teacher of those who are lost. Thank you so much for taking time to join us tonight for another study of the Word of God. John, any final thoughts or comments? No, appreciate the, uh, those in the chat room for joining us tonight. and uh, Maybe look ahead a little bit at the next few verses, get some, get some thoughts in mind for next week, and yep. share them up early in the beginning, and you can just you know, teach the lesson for us. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> we don't mind teaching the lesson based on your comments. That works. That's right. That's right. If, if we said anything that you've got a question about, or if you're watching this at a later time, you can send those questions to questions at scripturalway.org, questions at scripturalway.org, and we'll be happy to, to either write you back or bring it up in our next study. Thank you so much, and Lord willing, we'll see you back here again next Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. Central Time at live.scripturalway.org. Have a wonderful week.